My name is Chris Evans, Extension Forester with the University of Illinois. This webinar is an introduction to invasive species. So with this one, again, it's just the basics. We want to give you background on um, inform background information on invasive species, um, why there are problems, uh, kind of how they end up becoming invasive, and then why we're concerned about them. So again, it's just that real ba background introductory information to kind of catch you up on on what the issue um, is with invasive species. And this is not a new issue. We've been dealing with invasives for a long time um, in natural resources in general. Um, and, you know, historically, uh, I'm from the South, if you can't tell just by hearing my voice, but this was the species here that really uh, was kind of everybody's introduction to invasive species if you lived in the Southeast. Everybody knew kudzu. Everybody would look for uh, animal shapes in the in the infestations, or um, just see it on the roadside. And so that was um, kind of the way that people could understand invasive species. Is uh, you would tell them it's like kudzu, and they would kind of naturally understand its ability to take over and the problems with it. Um, here in the Midwest, and and nowadays, there's different kind of poster childs for invasives. I would say in Illinois. Uh, this species is probably the one that the most um, most people in the general public would be able to understand the issue with invasive species um, just by mentioning it. Most people have seen the YouTube videos of silver carp jumping and hitting people while they're trying to um, ski, water ski, and things like that. Um, so I'd say the general public understands silver carp and, and they're an issue, at least is knowledgeable about them. So it's more of the this is kind of the introductory or the or the the sexy species that people people know about invasives in general. But kind of overall, what I'm wanting to do with today's webinar, uh, I want to start with just some definitions, kind of catch us up on uh, some terminology we use when we talk about invasive species, and then get into uh, the ecology of invasive species, uh, how they differ from native species, how they differ from um, like an aggressive native that, that gets in there and what makes them a little different, uh, where they come from, how they're introduced, all of that. Uh, then I'll get into impacts, the actual problems with invasive species. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some examples of common Illinois invaders and with those I'll talk about plants since I'm a plant guy and we'll just hit a few of those uh, of the ones you may be familiar with or may not, the, the more common ones. And then I'll end up at the end uh, just talking about what is being done. What, how do people address invasive species? Um, uh, how do we mitigate their damages and, and things like that? So just starting in, uh, I like to start with the technical definition of, of what an invasive is. That's a term that is thrown around a whole bunch. People use it in slightly different ways. So I thought it would be useful to have um, kind of the technical definition of what an invasive species is. And really with that, there's three aspects um, to have a, a species become invasive or, or to be categorized as invasive, and they have to meet all, all three of these conditions. The first is that species is not native to the ecosystem. It's not a natural part of the ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's, it's then been introduced uh, that species has escaped and naturalized and formed some level of a free living population in that new ecosystem. And then those new populations, those naturalized populations have to cause some change that uh, we perceive as negative. So it has to disrupt um, natural communities, disrupt ecological functioning, has some kind of impact that is negative, detrimental to the ecosystems that could be ecological, uh, economic, or environmental damage, some kind of impact that's negative as a result of that species now being on the landscape. And so for a species to be invasive, it has to really meet all three of those criteria. There's a lot of species that are not native and have escaped, but don't really do any damage. There's some native species that can become, uh, grow at high levels and then we actually manage some but they're not uh, exotic. So there's different, uh, there's different categories, but really to be an invasive, for me, it has to meet all of these. Exotic, it's now escaped and naturalized, and it's doing some kind of negative impact. 
and this could be really all tax uh, uh, of species. It's not limited to plants. Uh, there's a lot of different examples of invasives in Illinois from a bunch of different taxa. Just going here, starting at the top left, we see a picture of uh, thousand canker disease on black walnut, which is one that we're concerned about getting into Illinois. It's uh, kind of found at our border and it's, it's a disease that impacts plants. Uh, next to it, of course, is silver carp. Um, to the right is um, feral hogs. So a lot of people don't realize we do have feral hogs uh, in Illinois. Uh, actually, the state has done a wonderful job of managing feral hogs and really keeping them in check, especially compared to some of the other Midwestern states. Uh, bottom right is a disease that impacts animals. So that's white nose syndrome uh, on bats. Uh, center uh, bottom is emerald ash borer, of course, uh, an invasive insect that's Im impacting. And then the bottom left is an invasive plant to bush honeysuckle. So again, all different taxa can kind of fall into these categories. I'm going to talk a more about plants today uh, just because that's what I do. But a lot of these principles, a lot of these concepts we talk about apply to um, all these different taxa. Just getting into uh, some more terminology, you know, this is what we see a lot with uh, invasive plants is they form these big stands um, and that's how they do their damage. Overall, when we, we see a dense stand of an invasive plant, uh, we call that an infestation. So it's a population of one that's growing in an area that's causing negative impacts. That would be an infestation. If that infestation is so dense, it's excluding nearly all the other plants and you have just one solid stand of, of that invasive, we call that uh, monoculture. So a mono, so this picture in the back here would be a monoculture uh, infestation of Japanese still grass in southern Illinois. Um, just some other terminologies. Um, we, uh, we consider the, the negative changes to those ecosystems, those impacts as a result of having those invasive species there, of having those infestations, those uh, negative changes, those detrimental changes, those alterations in the ecosystem functioning. Uh, we kind of collectively call all of that damage. So we say a, a species is damaging an ecosystem. That's what we're talking about. There's a negative change. It could be a, a loss in species uh, richness. It could be a change in ecological functioning. Uh, but that's what we're talking about when we just say there's a damage uh, as a result of invasion. Uh, continuing on with definitions, uh, you hear the term exotic a lot. And so exotic is a species that's not naturally found in a given ecosystem or region um, and has arrived into that new ecosystem not by its own means. So it did not um, migrate here on its own. It did not evolve in the system. It is uh, a natural part of a different ecosystem. And so once, when it's in the new ecosystem, we turn that as an exotic species. Um, you also hear the term non-native. Uh, those are synonymous. And then you contrast that with the term native. When we talk about native species, that is a species that is naturally found in a given ecosystem or a given region. And so it has then evolved there or naturally migrated uh, to that given ecosystem on its own. With plants uh, in, in the United States, it's kind of arbitrary, but we typically assign uh, this term native if the species was present pre-European -Euro settlement in our ecosystems. Um, so that those would be native species if it arrived with humans kind of after that we consider it an exotic species. And so exotic and non-native are synonymous. You can use those together. Uh, what exotic is not synonymous with is invasive. And so that it goes back to that definition of an invasive species. Um, it has to be an exotic species that causes damage. So there's no damage, it's not invasive, and there's plenty of examples of exotic plants that are not invasive. And here I have on the screen, uh, common dandelion. It's an exotic species. It's kind of a yard weed found everywhere, but it really doesn't do any type of ecological damage or negative impacts to ecosystems uh, to a great degree. So while it's a weed and maybe a nuisance in your yard, we don't consider it uh, an invasive species. So that's kind of where that, that break is. 
All right, so the question with invasives then, um, they're exotic, they're not naturally found here. How did they get here? If they didn't migrate on their own means, um, well, they were introduced. And so they, they, humans had a hand in bringing these species over to the new ecosystems. Uh, now that could be accidentally or intentionally, and there's examples of both and we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but it is kind of human aided introduction is how these exotic species arrive in the new ecosystems. Again, it's not a natural migration of the species. Um, here in Illinois, we are naturally getting uh, a new vertebrate species in the southern part of the state over the last 10 or so years, uh, the armadillo. They're showing up now, they're established part of our, our um, fauna down here. My argument is that they have arrived here on their own, they've moved, they've spread into Illinois naturally. Um, and so I don't consider them an exotic species, species uh, necessarily simply because it is a natural um, phenomenon that they're coming here on their own. So with these uh, other exotic, spe the exotic species, it's a not a natural migration. Um, so there's some kind of barrier of inhospitable habitat that prevents those species from naturally spreading here. And these barriers, you know, are, um, could be mountain chains. So a species in the Western US uh, is unable to cross over mountains uh, to get into a new area. And so that's a barrier. Uh, it could be salty oceans, something that keeps those species from being able to jump over that and, and arrive here on their own. There's some kind of barrier. I'm just getting into the introductions. Like I said, there's accidental introductions. So these are species that we, uh, we did not intend to bring over. Uh, they kind of hitchhiked, they came on there. Uh, they came accidentally. Um, it wasn't that we meant to bring that species. It's they, they came in um, uh, un, unbeknownst. So there's a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, the one on the left is Japanese stiltgrass. Uh, it's thought to be a packing material contaminant. Uh, so it, it arrived that way. Uh, the one on the right is an exotic species of daughter. And so that's a crop contaminant. So it could be in uh, seed mixes. It could be in grains, uh, soil mixes, potted plants. A great example of an accidental introduction in Illinois uh, is the emerald ash borer. So emerald ash borer, as uh, we'll talk about in a little bit, but is a really problematic beetle that's killing our ash trees. We did not intend it to come here. It was not an intentional introduction. It was a hitchhiker. We think it came in on packing material, wood, wood packing material or dunnage uh, in ships. And it was um, in that wood, uh, the wood wasn't treated and it, it kind of just accidentally arrived here. So there's a lot of accidental introductions. There is also a lot of in intentional introductions and for a lot of different reasons. So agriculture, pasture, uh, there's a lot of, of plants that were introduced um, for that uh, means. This is another picture of kudzu here. So kudzu originally was introduced for a couple reasons, but a big one was, um, was for agriculture. It was planted uh, for a forage crop for cattle. It was planted for erosion control. It was planted um, for a hay crop, there's a lot of different reasons out there. And in fact, I looked up this, uh, kudzu was so popular and it was promoted so heavily for agriculture that um, it was, there was actually a contest about how to best appreciate kudzu. And so in, in 1937, uh, there was this winning uh, poem by a, a person that, that called themselves the Countess of Kudzu. And this was their ode to kudzu. And so, I like it, I'm gonna read it to you, and just to show you kind of what the, the thoughts were back then about the benefits of kudzu, uh, especially to agriculture. And so it goes, in our sections of the woods, you save your soil and soul with kudzu. No one suffers from the floods who gives a little time to kudzu, nor gash nor goalie air denudes who covers up his land with kudzu. So there's a, it, People thought it was the best thing. They thought it was it was uh, providing forage, providing erosion control, a lot of reasons why it was used. And this is not the only one. I tend to collect these old brochures from back in the day when we were using uh, invasive plants and promoting them. And so here's a couple that were really used a lot for agriculture. 
Uh, the one on the left is multi-floor rows, and you can see it's being touted as, as the solution for living fences and for wildlife cover. Um, on the right is Cerecia lespedeza, and it was being used some as a, an agricultural crop and as erosion control as well. And, um, you know, this was up until the 50s, even early 60s, Cerecia lespedeza even a little later. Uh, we planted these, promoted them, uh, and, and brought them out there, you know, not knowing that they were going to end up becoming problems at all. And, and the funny thing about multiflora rose, you know, it was a living fence, uh, wildlife cover, all that, but kind of doing research for putting these talks together, I found that it was often also used and planted in the middle of highway medians as a crash barrier. And I, I think that's a horrible idea for me because if I happen to crash my car and I crash it into a stand of multiflora rose, um, and then you have to climb out and go through that thorny stuff. Oh, it's awful. But that's another use for it. Um, other uses, you know, erosion control. Again, this is crown vetch right here, widely planted for erosion control, used heavily up until very recently. Um, other reasons for wildlife plantings. This is uh, shrubby lespedeza right here, which was planted widely for, for quail. Um, just a couple more of those uh, little pamphlets. The one on the left is Russian olive, um, and on the right is autumn olive, but you can see it's for wildlife and other conservation uses. And I love that the autumn olive, the, the wildlife they tout on the front of this cover is the exotic ringneck pheasant. But there's, a, there's again, a lot of plants that were planted for, for wildlife. And then the last, uh, intentional introduction purpose that I'm going to talk about is horticulture. So a lot of our plants, particularly our woody plants, um, started out, uh, were introduced uh, through the horticultural trade. And in fact, a, a paper in the early 2000s uh, found that out of all the, the woody invasive plants in North America, over 80% of those started out as horticultural plants. So it does tend to be a, a major pathway of spread for these species. And you can find them still. Um, you look, look online and find things for sale. This is a uh, princess tree or also called empress tree, a major problem uh, in the southern Illinois and, and other areas. But you can see if you find it online for sale here, it's touted as being the fastest growing tree in the world. So statements like that should definitely be a red flag for you that um, they might be worth looking into. Um, other things, if you find stuff for sale online, like this burning bush, and you can see the part I highlight, highlighted on the top right, uh, this item is not available for sale and it has a bunch of different states. When you see that, uh, that's another red flag. That means usually means that those states have banned the sale of that plant because it's an invasive. Um, so just again, another red flag, even though you can find some of them. Um, it's not just woody plants either. Um, so this is teasel and teasel uh, is all along our roadways and it was uh, was and still is used as a dried flower arrangement plant. So you can buy teasel, you can buy teasel seeds. Um, but of course, this is the problem with teasel on our roadsides, right? Yeah, it just takes off. And so with this idea of this ornamental pathway, it's not surprising that a lot of our invasive plants started out as ornamentals. Particularly if you, you look at the traits of what I consider uh, a good ornamental plant is and compare it with the traits of what a really bad invasive plant is. So you'll start to see a lot of similarities here. So a, a good ornamental is something that's hardy and easy to grow. Uh, a bad invasive is a habitat generalist. It grows anywhere. Uh, a good ornamental is something that is carefree. It doesn't require attention. It takes care of itself. Uh, a bad invasive outcompetes other plants. It takes care of itself. Good ornamentals may be ones that are easy to propagate. Uh, bad invasive spread often because they reproduce easily. A good ornamental, good ornamental may be one that has showy abundant flowers. A lot of our bad invasives have abundant seeds. So you're starting to see these similarities here. Uh, good ornamental may be one that attracts birds. And a lot of our worst invasive species, particularly our woody invasive species, have bird dispersed seeds. And then finally, a good ornamental is something that is pest and disease resistant. And one of the mechanisms for invasive species uh, becoming problems 
is typically they're not affected by our native pests and diseases. So it's not surprising, again, that um, some of the choices we make in selecting ornamentals uh, are, are similar to some of the characteristics that become, uh, that a plant needs to become a problematic invasive. And so that, again, that's explaining why so many of our invasive plants started out uh, as, as ornamentals. But I don't want to, to harp on the ornamental, uh, the horticultural industry, and it's not like every ornamental plant or every exotic plant ends up becoming uh, an invasive. There's actually, you know, these different steps uh, through this process of becoming invasive. And not every plant makes it through each of these steps. They're, they kind of act as filters, right? So all of all the plants or all the species, not just plants, but all the species that are introduced, not all of them are able to escape of those and that just means escape means they're able to reproduce on their own those that are able to eat reproduce on their own not all of them are able to naturalize or and establish and form those free living populations of those that have formed those populations uh, not all of them are able to um, grow to a level or, or build up to a level and spread to a level that they start causing damage and we consider them invasive in fact there's a, a, a publication out there that has looked at this and looked at kind of a meta-analysis of all the, the invasives uh, and all the exotic species and kind of came up with what they think is it generally holds true, they call it the TENS rule, is that in general 10% um, of the species, not just plants, but species, um, exotic species are able to pass through each of these transitional phases from introduction to invasive. So each of these are a filter and it takes out 90% of the species. So if you look at it, then if you start with a thousand different introduced species, roughly on average, 10% uh, or so, or a hundred of them uh, are able to escape. Out of those roughly hundred that are able to escape, about 10% of those are able to actually naturalize. So we're 10. Out of those 10 that are able to naturalize on average, one of them is going to end up becoming an invasive. So really you're looking at one out of a thousand introduced species becomes a, ends up becoming a problematic invasive. It's a small amount of them. What is that one tenth of 1%? Um, so it's not many, but the ones that are uh, become big problems. And just to complicate that, a lot of these invasive species um, goes through what we've turned to a lag phase. And the lag phase just simply means that um, there's a period of time, often a long period of time, after that species is introduced, that it doesn't show invasive tendencies right away. Uh, it'll behave, it'll stay at low levels, and then uh, something triggers it and there's a start of some exponential growth and they take off. And, um, there's examples of privet in the southeast being uh, there for 100 years before it really became a problem, collery pear, here was planted for 30 years or so before it really started seeing it spread. So this does tend to happen with a lot of species. There's some level of a lag phase and so predicting invasives or finding invasives early, it just complicates that. Um, so why do these become invasive? Why do they behave differently in their new environment uh, than uh, where they're naturally found? There's a couple of theories behind this and uh, the first one is this idea of an enemy release hypothesis. And with that, basically every species in its native system has evolved with a, a bunch of other organisms that it interacts with. So if we're talking about a plant, there could be insects that feed on that plant, there could be diseases that that plant host, there could be vertebrates that, that feed on that plant. Um, there's a lot of um, organisms that interact with that plant and, and um, they've kind of found some level of balance over the years. And what that does is it puts that plant uh, into check a little bit. So if you take that organism and you move it up and transplant it and move it into a new environment that's free from those, those interactions, those natural predators, natural parasites, natural diseases, um, it, you've removed those checks and balances. So it's that plant may be free to grow a little faster, produce a little bit more seed, uh, than it would in its native range, and especially than it would with the native species that it's now in there with that does have those interactions. 
so the idea with that is it just gives it that competitive edge. It's able to more quickly capture resources necessary for survival. Um, the second uh, theory behind uh, why things become invasive is this idea of rapid evolution. And so with that, uh, a species in a new environment has a whole different selection pressures exerted on it. And so those new pressures um, cause that, that population to change um, pretty rapidly to adapt to that new environment and then almost create a, um, a, a you know, a super competitive um, population of that species. And this idea behind rapid evolution, we've seen this, um, it's, it's, it's not, um, it's not unknown out there. One great example of this um, out on the landscape in the Midwest or throughout the U.S. really is this idea of um, crops that are now resistant to herbicides, not crops, but weeds that are now resistant to herbicide. So the idea behind that is there, there are crops that have been engineered that um, can withstand certain herbicides. And so once they became, came on the market, uh, fields were sprayed multiple times with a single herbicide. And in the past, that wasn't really a practice. And so that represented a new selection pressure for agricultural weeds. So we found that once that new pressure started within a decade or so, um, uh, the weed populations, some weed populations developed resistance. They rapidly evolved to that new selection to develop resistance. So that's kind of the, the same idea uh, that I'm talking about with invasives and, and it takes a plant that's our species has to be pretty plastic in terms of genetics and be able to adapt quickly. But um, an interesting thing with this one, a good example would be purple loosestrife, which is a wetland species that we have in the, uh, the US that's native to Europe, but it's a major problem here. We think that um, when it was moved over to the United States, it went through this rapid evolution. And there's some studies where they actually brought United States populations of purple loosestrife back to Europe and planted them in a common garden experiment, uh, experiment with the, the native purple loose strife that's always been in Europe and the, the exotic one from the US actually was more competitive, grew taller and, and had invasive tendencies even when you brought it back into its native range. So it's really interesting to see kind of the impacts of this rapid evolution. Um, some of the other, one of the big other uh, conditions for something to become invasive is it has to have a suitable climate. Um, so this is a climate map of the world based on temperature and moisture. And you can see in Illinois where that dark green, southern Illinois, we're bordering on the, the yellow. And so if you look at other parts of the country uh, with similar climate, you're seeing areas of Europe, Eastern Asia, Japan, those, uh, those areas. So it's not um, surprising then that a lot of our species that we have as invasives are things like purple loosestrife and garlic mustard that started in Europe or native to Europe, uh, Japanese honeysuckle, Chinese lespedeza. Um, it's simply because they're from similar climates, similar habitats. So it's no surprise that um, a species that does well in what is basically an oak hickory forest in eastern China is going to do well in our oak hickory forest. Uh, if you go to other parts of the country, their invasive species are from other parts of the world. So if you go out west, they're going to have things from the Mongolian steppes or Russia um, because that's a climate match. All right, so how do these species become invasive? Uh, talking about plants now, basically they're faster or more efficient at acquiring these limited resources. So as we know, every plant needs water, sunlight, nutrients, and space to grow. And so invasive species are very efficient uh, at using or in acquiring uh, these limited resources. And they do that through multiple ways. Some have very high seed production. So this is multiflora rows. And there's estimates out there that one multiflora rose bush can produce up to a half a million seeds per year. Others just have a longer growing season. Uh, so this is bush honeysuckle right here, amber honeysuckle. And so it greens up two and a half weeks or so before our native shrubs and stays green three or more weeks longer at the end of the season. And so it basically has a month and a half to two months more photosynthetic time than our native shrubs. 
Others are uh, just have effective means of seed dispersal. So this is Japanese chaff flower here and it has a little barbs on its seeds that can hook onto clothes and fur and spread it around. Others have early growth, early reproduction, and this is garlic mustard. It's one of the first plants to bloom in the spring, uh, so it, it gets its reproduction and its growth done early. Others just have fast growth. So this is Phragmites, which is a wetland uh, invasive plant. So it just grows and, and puts on a lot of height quick to over, overtop uh, other species. And then some species just have uh, allelopathic properties. And so this is uh, something we're finding more and more out about um, these days is the idea behind allelopathy. And we're finding more and more plants have this. And it's not just limited to uh, invasive plants. A lot of plants have the ability to give off levels of chemicals through their roots that inhibit or kill other plants and give itself a bit of a competitive edge. We all know black walnut, which is a native plant, of course. Um, there's certain things you can't plant underneath of it because of it's allelopathic. What we're finding is a lot of invasive plants have some level of allelopathic properties to help give them a competitive edge. All right, so moving into spread, just hit one more definition. Uh, I talk about a propagule. So a propagule is really the means of reproduction and spread for an organism. And the technical definition of a propagule is a structure that can become detached from the plant and give rise to a new plant. And so typically we're talking about seeds, fruit and seeds with that as a propagule, and that's the most common one. But there's a lot of different propagules out there. Some are sexual reproduction, so that would be seeds and fruit. Uh, but a lot of invasive plants spread primarily through asexual means. So on the top there, um, on the asexual side, that's um, milfoil, Eurasian water milfoil. And so it spreads uh, through multiple means, but one of them is stem fragments. So a stem can break apart and be able to root and grow a new plant. Um, moving farther left, those are turions. They're of uh, curly pondweed. So again, that's an asexual uh, reproductive structure that the plant forms and then those can spread. In the middle are bulbils, which are another little asexual reproductive structure, but that's for Chinese yam. Other plants spread through rhizomes. On the bottom left is kogon grass. Uh, bottom right is the, the root structure for Johnson grass. So there's a lot of means that a plant can spread and, and move around and disperse that doesn't involve pollination and sexual reproduction. Uh, on the right, the top, we have garlic mustard, which is seeds. In the middle is uh, Japanese chaff flower showing those uh, little barbs. And then the bottom is colt's foot, which is another in invasive that has the little fluffy seed like dandelion. And those, these propagules can spread and disperse out on the landscape uh, in multiple ways. And different plants utilize different strategies. So some, a lot of plants spread by uh, water, flood waters. So on the bottom left there, you see a garlic mustard growing right next to a stream. Uh, many of our invasive woody plants have bird dispersed seeds. So birds or other animals will eat them, then pass them through their gut system and spread the seeds that way. Uh, some are just gravity. They move downhill um, like that. So that Japanese stilt grass in the picture. And then some are wind dispersed seeds. So these again are all natural spread mechanisms that all plants utilize. Uh, invasive plants utilize these as well. But uh, another spread mechanism, unfortunately, uh, is humans. And so we end up moving plants around, not only introducing them to new environments, but when they're in the new environment, we spread them around ourselves, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. And I love uh, the story behind this picture. So I like to add it into all my talks about invasive species. And I got this picture from the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, their vegetation management crew. And what we're looking at here is a pile of fill dirt uh, that's covered in musk thistle. So musk thistle is a, a also called nodding thistle is a major invasive um, throughout the east, particularly in Tennessee where this picture was taken. And the story behind it is they were doing some level of road construction or culvert work or something in the park. Uh, and they needed field dirt uh, for that construction. So they, got a, uh, they bought a pile of field dirt and they put it in their maintenance yard. And that's where it sat until they needed it a year or two later. And then when they got back to, to, to uh, look at the pile of field dirt, this is what they found. Uh, it was covered and loaded in the inside all the field dirt with seeds for musk thistle. 
So if they would have used this uh, field dirt when they first got it and, and used it in the construction throughout the national park, they basically would have been planting musk thistle everywhere. Right? So we, again, this is an unintentional spread, but we move these things around quite a bit. Uh, a little closer to home, this is from Southern Illinois. I took this picture standing on a gravel road and uh, the pile of gravel there, the grass that's all behind that pile of gravel and growing into that pile of gravel is Japanese stilt grass. And so it's no surprise uh, whenever the, the road crew comes and gets the gravel and to spread it back on the road, they're gonna be dragging stilt grass with them wherever that gravel gets taken, right? Just one more example of that, of spread. Um, this is Japanese chaff flower again, and it's a picture of my brother's dog and all those little burrs stuck in its hair. And then also on my uh, coat sleeve at the bottom there is all Japanese stilt grass. So those are, we're gonna, or sorry, Japanese chaff flower. So we're gonna spread those around. Um, again, unintentionally, um, we move plants around. We move species around quite a bit. Um, just thinking of uh, feral swine, we talked about wild hogs earlier. The major avenue for those getting spread throughout um, new in, into new environments nowadays are people intentionally releasing them to try to create hunting opportunities. So again, we are um, a major cause for these things moving around. Just talking about impacts of these invasives, you know, invasive species are universally recognized as a priority issue with natural resource management. Uh, they're considered one of the four major threats to U.S. forest and grasslands um, nationally, right up there with climate change and habitat loss. In Illinois, through our Illinois Wildlife Action Plan, uh, dealing with invasive species is considered one of the six primary challenges to conserving our rare and declining wildlife in Illinois. And there's a lot of impacts out there from invasives. You know, just roughly, uh, they can lead to a loss of species diversity, loss of ecosystem functioning, loss of productivity, uh, loss of wildlife habitat. There's a lot of, of different ways uh, that we see impacts from these invasives. One kind of classic story of the impact of an invasive is, is told with these pictures. Uh, so this isn't a picture out west of the sequoias. This is actually um, American chestnut in the Appalachians. And so historically that plant, uh, the American chestnut was one of the most abundant trees in the Eastern United States. One of the most ecologically important trees it was food for um, lots of different wildlife, a, kind of a linchpin of those ecosystems. Um, but uh, when some other chestnuts were brought over as ornamentals or for crops, along with it came a disease called chestnut blight. Uh, the, the exotic chestnuts were resistant to it because they evolved together, but our American chestnuts had basically no natural resistance to this uh, exotic disease. And in a matter of a few decades, this plant went from being the most abundant, uh, one of the most common trees, most important trees in the eastern United States, to being uh, almost functionally extinct in the wild due to an invasive, so a, a drastic change. And we're seeing that um, not to level, not to quite that degree, but we're seeing that even right now in Illinois over the last 10 years uh, with the arrival and spread of emerald ash borer. So emerald ash borer, again, is one of those poster child invasive species. Uh, it was introduced accidentally. Uh, it first showed up, we first found it in Illinois, I think in 2006. Um, and our ash trees, our native ash trees, of which we have five, really have no natural resistance or very little natural resistance to emerald ash borer. And so we're seeing uh, ash trees die by the millions uh, in Illinois due to this species and it's spreading around. It basically eats the inside of the, uh, the cambial layer of the tree out and starves the tree. And we're finding in the, in the less than 15 years it's been in Illinois, uh, it's basically moved across the whole state. Right? So this is a, it's a drastic spread. Within the next 20 years, um, we're, it's estimated it's gonna kill over 100 million ash trees in the state alone. So again, a, a drastic impact from, from one invasive. Um, but it's not just, um, you know, not just killing one individual plant, one individual species. Uh, there's other impacts out there. If you look at, this chart is from uh, data that was from the Illinois Wildlife Action Plan. And so this is, a list of our, what we call species in greatest need of conservation, our rare and declining wildlife. 
And out of the 240 species that are identified in these different wildlife groups, 152 of those or 63% are threatened um, in part, are, are there and rare and declining in part because of interactions with invasive species. So again, it, it impacts not only ecosystems, but direct impact to some of our rarest and most vulnerable wildlife out there. And then this is a, a, a another story to tell just again about uh, impacts of invasives. And I know this part of the, the presentation gets a little uh, depressing because we're all we're talking about impacts, but it's important to, to, to highlight this. And this actually, uh, the, the plant highlighted in this picture is actually a rare plant. So this is green trillium, which is a state endangered, globally rare plant. Um, just a few populations known from the state. And I took this picture because I wanted to take a cool picture of a rare plant. But afterwards, I started looking um, at the picture and what uh, what else is in the picture. And so if you take it and you look, the, the plants that are highlighted in red now are all Japanese honeysuckle and the plant that's highlighted in purple is oriental bittersweet. Both of those are, are kind of thicket forming vines that if left to their own devices would have completely overtopped um, this population of a rare plant, right? So this plant population without intervention would have been basically doomed um, to, to blink out um, due to these invasives. The good news is, is we worked on it, we controlled the invasives and that population is act actively growing now. But just, uh, I thought it's a good highlight of kind of an individual impact of uh, an invasive plant on a rare plant. Just some examples here of some of these impacts. Uh, garlic mushroom, we've talked about a few times. It's one of those allelopathic plants. It's also a plant that doesn't really need to associate with mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. So it's allelopathy is it basically exudes um, almost a fungicide out of, its, out of its roots that inhibits the growth of the mycorrhizae that gives itself a, a competitive edge. There's some interesting work out there with bush honeysuckle. They're finding that uh, invasion of bush honeysuckle into a forest, um, those plant, those shrubs are so good at competing for water and nutrients that it leads to a, a decline in the growth rate of the overstory trees sometimes by as much as 50%. So your trees are growing slower, that's gonna have ecological and economic impacts. Not only that, it's um, infestations can basically eliminate native shrubs, tree seedling diversity since it's cast such a heavy shade. And then it's closing in and impacting rare habitats like hill prairies. Getting into aquatics is another uh, impact. Curly pondweed, one of our aquatic plants that we deal with. Uh, there's a, a southern Illinois lake where we dealt with curly pondweed and um, this plant dies off in summer and it creates a, a big need for oxygen and it actually can deoxygenate the water in um, low oxygen uh, habitats. And so there's a lake in southern Illinois that experienced a series of fish kills uh, where 90% of the fish estimated uh, of the adult fish were killed out of this lake um, multiple times due to um, deoxygenation from uh, curly pondweed infestations. And then just a couple more things. Uh, we're finding impacts to, uh, to wildlife from these exotic shrubs. There's potential that they can increase nest predation for bird species, alter water, chem water chemistry and food sources for fish, and just change microclimate conditions for, for reptiles. And then uh, there's a seems to be a close association with tick-borne diseases uh, with some of these invasive plants. So there's a lot of a lot of impacts out there. Um, and there's a lot of invasives. No matter what habitat you get into, there's a chance that you know, you're gonna have to deal with invasive species. Uh, a lot of times you're dealing with more than one at a time. And so I'm gonna highlight, just to kind of finish up here, I'll quickly just mention some of the, the worst, what I consider the worst invasive plants for terrestrial systems. Uh, bush honeysuckle, I consider probably the worst invasive we have fully across the state um, because of just the level of the damage it can do and that it can invade higher quality habitats. Uh, common and glossy buckthorns are very similar, but they're restricted to the northern part of the state largely, again, forming those huge thickets. Garlic mustard we've talked about and its impact particularly to spring wildflowers and the understory flora of forest uh, is a major issue. Autumn olives issue in uh, more open forest, um, 
uh, tree plantings, newly developed area, new de newly developing forest areas. Um, it could be a major issue and very difficult to manage. Uh, it can also grow in more open forest. Oriental, Oriental bittersweet is a vine that uh, can overwhelm trees, girdle them, pull them down, break limbs, um, amazingly devastating. Uh, fortunately, it's not uh, as common as some of these others, but where it's at, it's amazingly devastating plant. Um, just at the level it can grow. Uh, tree of Heaven, um, where it grows, it's a clonal species that's very hard to control in certain environments. So again, another big issue. And then lastly, kind of a new one uh, that we're seeing out on the landscape is collery pear. Um, that's we're seeing spread across the state now and, and we're threatening to become one of our major invaders. And so I'm going to end the talk with just very quickly with some of the things that are being done out there. So what are we doing? How, what's the response to invasives? Uh, one is prevention, trying to take steps from, from getting them introduced in the first place. Um, so that could be things like boot brush stations, sanitation, cleaning uh, requirements for equipment, uh, regulations like the Illinois Exotic Weed Act that prevent the sale and transport of some of these species. Other things are being done is mapping, survey, monitoring. This is a, a picture of a crew that went out and we mapped invasive plants in a wilderness area last winter. Um, but just knowing where these species are, tracking them, having them on maps just help us respond. And then things like control. So managing these invasive plants, um, getting them out once they're established. Um, we've developed guides like our Management of Invasive Plants and Pest of Illinois guide. I can um, send everybody a link to this when I email, email everybody the uh, handouts from the presentation. Uh, there's a lot of volunteerism out there, people joining in to help, and the Illinois Master Naturalist is a great group that has done a lot of volunteering for agencies and, and, um, and partners at helping to control invasive plants. And then collaboration. A lot of people working together to control these invasive species. Uh, there's local groups like the River to River Cooperative Weed Management Area in Southern Illinois or the Headwaters Invasive Plant Partnership in East Central Illinois um, that join together to collaborate on issues and to do trainings and workshops and to, and to, uh, to deal with invasives. And the one thing about invasives is they, they ignore property boundaries, right? So they don't respect those. And so working together and collaborating has been a big issue. And I will end uh, my portion here before we get into questions, just with a, a quote that I really like that I think sums up kind of why we're controlled, why we're worried about invasives. And this comes from the Nature Conservancy's Global Invasive Species Initiative. And they say, we control invasive species because they are harming the native plants and animals we care so much about protecting. And I think that's a good summary. It's not that they're exotic. It's not that we don't like them because there's something different. It's we, we have to deal with them. We're concerned about them because they're impacting um, our native systems. And with that, I will open it up and we've got 10 or so minutes for any questions. And so you can put questions in the chat box um, and we'll try to get to them that way. All right, great talk, Chris, thank you. Um, we already have quite a few questions uh, that have come in through uh, throughout the presentation. So we'll jump right in about how long from a species introduction to when the Midwest ecosystem stabilizes to it and is no longer considered invasive, such as honeybees? Um, that's a good question. Um, you could argue that, uh, that it never, um, never stops being considered invasive, right? In some ways, simply because those, those impacts are still there. Um, and again, it has to have some kind of negative damage. So some species could be here for a long time, be established and never have a lot of negative impacts. So it would never be invasive. I wouldn't think that a species um, would never like not be considered invasive. It might be that its impacts are lessened because um, just because the impacts have already been seen or species have kind of evolved a way to work around it. And, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any kind of amount of time that you could say with that. Hmm. 
Okay, sorry, I'm kind of juggling here. Um, let's see, that one was answered. Why don't we simply think of these new non-native plants as an evolutionary development? Might damage just be change? Um, that's a really good question. I hear that a lot. Um, one, I would argue that um, our ecosystems here have developed over roughly the last 10,000 years. Um, they've built communities of plants together. Um, we have interactions going on and then you get a new species moving in that interrupts that and we've seen time and time again that that yields um, uh, loss of species diversity, loss of those functioning. And so to me, I value and I'd say a lot of people value our uh, species, our communities, our ecosystems that have developed over time and then to have a species moved over that would have never been here on its own and then cause a lot of disruption and a lot of um, loss is that's going to be negative. So I, I definitely get what you're saying about accepting that as a new as a new natural. But my argument is it's not a natural system and the, the impacts from them are so great that we need to be concerned about them. Okay. Um, butterfly bush is invasive farther south. Is it in the process of becoming invasive in central Illinois? Uh, good question. I don't know particularly. I know that a butterfly bush has been found. Um, it's a major problem in Kentucky, which is next to us. Um, it's actually banned in some states like Oregon. I don't have a lot of experience with it in Illinois and seeing it escaped. I've not seen it escaped uh, at any major level in the, in the state. That's not to say that it isn't, I just don't know about it. And so that goes back to this idea of mapping and, and tracking species. The more we know about them, the more we can make those assessments. Okay. Um, let's see, so this next one, I uh, had a bit of chatter following the question, will the ash borer die out if it has no food source? And uh, some others suggested there might be some other trees uh, that the ash borer could move into. But, um, so what we've seen so far, and this is based on, um, it was first found in Michigan in 2002, but they estimated that it was there already for at least 10 years before they discovered it. And um, they haven't found that it's gone, even in those environments. Um, even though most of the ash is gone, what happens with emerald ash borer, when it kills the ash trees, it really, only attacks those that are two inches in diameter or a little bigger. And so you have a cohort of species of, of ash that are smaller, that are growing kind of into vulnerability. And so those are enough to sustain the population um, for a certain level, as well as certain trees that just get missed. And so even though the population drops of ash borer drops drastically following that first wave of mortality, We've not yet seen where it's driven to extinction with just the lack of ash. There has been um, a couple observations of it spreading to uh, related plants like uh, fringe tree, which is another one in that same family. We don't know if it's necessarily would be able to thrive or maintain a population on a different species. But again, this is all new enough now that um, a lot of this is still being kind of figured out as we go. Okay. Um, so another question comment. I know it is always a subject of debate, but what is the latest research on pulling garlic mustard versus herbicide only? Um, good question. Um, so actually, if you want to listen to the first talk in our invasive species symposium on May 11th, we're going to be talking about some herbicide trials and timing work that we're doing here on garlic mustard. Um, and so there's, there's some things where um, hand pulling can be effective. There's always a risk that you're disturbing the soil and you're promoting uh, more of it to germinate. But I would say with any, um, any kind of control program, having an integrated control program where you're using multiple, multiple methods is, um, is effective and, and needed. And then, We'll get into more detail on that May 11th talk specifically about what we're finding with herbicide and garlic mustard. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the most effective method for bush honeysuckle control within a forest? Fire, herbicide, combination? 
Um, again, you know, every situation is going to be a little different. Um, it depends on the, the level of infestation, what other species you have there, what non-target impacts. So it's really hard to say what's the best. We've done um, larger, larger shrubs are hard to pull. And so they're going to be ones that you probably want to do a combination of cut and then treat with herbicide. Um, smaller things can be hand pulled or sprayed. Um, heavy infestations can be uh, mowed or, or mulched down or, or with a forestry mulcher and then sprayed with the re-sprouts. Prescribed fire has a component we're finding that top kills them and, and does a good job of knocking them back. There's a lot, there's so many methods, it's hard to say what's the best. Okay. Um, let's see, some of these I'm not sure. Um, You kind of address this with the bush honeysuckle, but this is kind of a more general one. Do controlled burns help with getting rid of invasive species? It depends on the situation and it depends on the species. So we find that some species are promoted by fire. And so one example would be Cerecia lespedeza. Um, it seems to stimulate it to germinate. Uh, Japanese stiltgrass, it seems to stimulate the, the seeds to germinate with that one as well. So there's suites of invasives that tend to be promoted by fire and there's suites of invasives that fire can be a component of control and there's other invasives that I don't think it makes a big difference one way or the other. Um, there's a really good document that was put together, I think by the US Fish and Wildlife Service that goes into fire and invasive plants and it really gets into this uh, topic in very detail and very specific to different species. So that's uh, a document I'd recommend searching for online. You can find it as a PDF. It's a really good summary of this. And the other place to look for a lot more information on fire and invasive plants would be uh, the U.S. Forest Service's Fire Effects Information System. That's online as well and it has a lot of detail about kind of the impacts of fire on a lot of different species including invasives. Okay, great. Well, I definitely want to thank everybody for attending and I hope to see you on future webinars.